uh, Jonathan is a, a well-known researcher and engineer in the area of uh, earthquake geotechnical engineering and liquefaction is one of his uh, favorite topics. Uh, he has done a lot of work in, in, in reconnaissance and, and interpretation of effects of liquefaction on different types of structures, uh, including earthquakes from Turkey, Japan, US, and certainly he is contributing a lot <coughs> here in Christchurch uh, with investigations and, and detailed studies. And today, I hope he is going to cover some of those issues. Jonathan, please. Thank you. So today, I'm going to share some ideas uh, in terms of liquefaction-induced building movements. And critically, uh, a student whose uh, work is prominent in this is uh, Professor Shade Dashti, who's now a professor, assistant professor at the University of Colorado Boulder. She performed much of the centrifuge testing and the numerical analysis I'm going to talk about. But it always starts in the field. And without Mishko and without the cohort of phenomenal uh, students that he has here in terms of doing the documentation of, of the effects of liquefaction in the city of, uh, of Christchurch, we wouldn't be able to gain these insights. And so it really is a partnership. In fact, it's, it's more of a University of Canterbury taking the lead in University of California, Berkeley, and then others such as Tom O'Rourke at Cornell. And, and you also uh, probably met uh, Russell Green at Virginia Tech. We are happy to contribute as much as we can, but we actually are learning a lot more than we're giving, and I think this is something that's important. Uh, GEAR is the Geotechnical Extreme Events Reconnaissance uh, Organization, and that associ association is focused on, and the tagline is, turning disasters into knowledge. It's terrible what's happened. It's terrible what happened in Japan and what happened in Chile and what's happened in Southern California 20 years ago. It would be more uh, disastrous if we did not learn from these things and go forward. And as you probably realize, uh, construction practices and things like that may change, but, but soil is soil is soil, and so we can really transfer these pieces of information across the, uh, across the globe. The National Science Foundation is not just a sponsor of GEAR, but also much of the work I'm going to talk about. So after a very brief introduction, I'm going to talk about field observations. That's where we're going to start. That's where we should always start, we should always come back to. Up until this series of earthquakes that you had, we didn't really have the well-documented case history. I mean, when would you anticipate a city would undergo several earthquakes, five plus, that would cause liquefaction in varying degrees, and all done at the full scale? And so we go into the centrifuge, and we make a model of the soil, and we can put in earthquakes and see how it responds. Even with your uh, earthquakes, it still provides a lot of good insight. Numerical analysis, once it's calibrated and we have some sense that it's reliable, can gain some insights and then some conclusions. The problem is simply stated. All you have to do as a foundation engineer, a earthquake engineer, is estimate liquefaction-induced building movements, such as a site right here where we have some silt and silty sand, gravel, and then let's say we have a four-story building at that site. Engineers use the tools that are available and not necessarily the right tools in all cases. What we have been doing, we've been doing this in the US and I've seen this in New Zealand as well, I think this is done around the world, is we estimate liquefaction induced free field settlement of level ground. Those are the techniques we have, such as the techniques that are based on Ishihara's approach in 1992 that Methods like Zhang et al., the CPT-based approach, are essentially calibrated against the, the data from this, where we do a liquefaction triggering analysis, we calculate factors of safety of liquefaction triggering, and when we have low factors of safety, we look at things like relative density, we might use tip resistance from a CPT, we might use the SPT to get a relative density, and then we come in here with the factor of safety and the relative density, and we get an estimate layer by layer of the post-liquefaction reconsolidation volumetric strain. And it might be on the order of 1%, 3%, 5%. We take the volumetric strain for each layer times the thickness of each layer, and we sum that up and we estimate a total settlement of the building. That's what we often do, but that cannot be possibly right because that's free field. We wouldn't be doing this calculation if we didn't have that building there. It's the building settlement that we really want to understand. So why are we using a method that estimates 1D 
post-liquefaction, volumetric reconsolidation, when what we really care about is the building settlement, which will be largely devictoric or shear induced, and therefore this cannot possibly work. Now other people have looked at data from uh, uh, case histories. Tokimatsu's done a lot of work in this area. Ricardo Dobry's collected a lot of data and supplemented that with centrifuge tests. And one of the very popular plots, I had used this as a practicing engineer. I'm hoping to convince you never to use it again. And that is this plot of settlement due to liquefaction on a building, normalized by the liquefaction layer thickness. And then also they found foundation width was important. They also normalized that by liquefaction layer thickness. The problem I have with this normalization, it suggests that the thickness of the liquefiable layer is a key element or key component. If you double the thickness of the liquefiable layer, this kind of normalization would suggest you get twice as much settlement. It's saying it's all about volumetric, but that's not what we see. We go to Adipazari, Turkey, which really was one of the first cases where we had relatively thinner layers of liquefied material and we saw the obvious consequence is buildings actually punched into the liquefiable ground. It was a big warning. <laughs> uh, that's what the building owner cares about. They actually have done a survey where they've gone back to Lake Sapanja and brought the survey forward and the entire city of Adipazari has dropped about a meter or so. But as a building owner, I don't necessarily care about the fact that now I'm at elevation 30 meters as opposed to elevation 31 meters. What I care about is when I punch into the neighboring soil. That breaks the utilities, that causes this bearing capacity failure, that causes this heavy wall of a two-story building to punch in the liquefiable material and the liquefied material to push up with a kind of almost a constant volume kind of deformation in that case and, and, and you see the obvious uh, damage to the structure. In many cases it was only a one to two to at most three meter thick liquefiable layer, in this case it was a non-plastic silt or a slightly plastic silt, that led to a building undergoing a bearing capacity failure or a building punching into the ground and you can see some of the heave in the ground next to it. You cannot estimate these settlements. You grossly un underpredict them if you basically say, wow, the building settlement is proportional to the thickness of the liquefiable layer. It's not. It's, a, it's essentially squeezing out like it was toothpaste once it's very, very softened. And we're actually finding that if you have a sufficiently thick liquefiable layer, if you've just got a meter or two of liquefiable material, that material could soften and squeeze out laterally and the building settles. And that settlement is not proportional to the thickness of the liquefiable layer. The best example of that is this example that uh, Professor Tokimatsu brought forth in Let Us See when we were doing the gear investigation. This is in Yuresu in uh, Japan, magnitude 9 earthquake. We have a tall building that's supported on piles. The piles are driven down and supported in a bearing layer well below the liquefiable layer. And so, from all intents and purposes, we can assume that this did not move, or it didn't move appreciably. Then this entire island was a constructed island, the entire area liquefied in this, this subdivision, and everything settled down. This ground moved 30 centimeters down, you can see it's relatively uniform free field settlement with respect to this pile supported structure that did not settle. That's the volumetric reconsolidation settlement. That's what the Ishihara plot estimates is that 30 centimeters that the ground moved down relative to the pile supported structure. What this building Odin cares about is this three story building on a shallow mat which is actually pushed in to the free field settlement an additional 40 centimeters. This person is standing there with their feet on the mat and they can only see up to maybe up to the, uh, to the knees. This building has punched 40 centimeters into this. It's 70 centimeters relative to the pile support structure. That's what we want to get, is that additional settlement that we're getting due to devictoric strain. I've, Chile had a number of very good examples of liquefaction and its effects on structures. One of the most uh, disappointing 
is a very bright young structural engineer, had got the, the, the job to build a, with working with an architect to build this wonderful new regional hospital. It was put into action about 16 months before this March 2010 earthquake. So when they needed this hospital the most, it was put out of operation because of liquefaction. Before they had a one to two story light building here, they replaced that with this more modern facility. They realized that there were issues in terms of dynamic shaking, so these, these dark blue lines are actually seismic isolation joints to allow the building parts to respond independently to transient motions. Uh, the buildings have different story heights, so you have six story buildings, you have some two story buildings, one story buildings. If I was going to do a centrifuge test, I might put buildings of different heights and hence weight all at the same site to see what would happen. The foundation was a spread footings, but they were tied together with nice grade beams. We spent about four hours traveling this location from our field location, and as I'm coming in this town, I see no evidence of liquefaction. I'm wondering why did I spend four hours driving to this remote location because someone suggested there might be an issue with a hospital that had something to do with liquefaction. In fact, this building right here, no evidence of liquefaction, no settlement. But you walk along this building, once we came to this hospital and saw it, one, it was out of commission. They actually had a field hospital in the, in, the, in the back parking lot. There was liquefaction all along the building. Structural engineers talk about the fact that liquefaction is bad for buildings. Buildings are bad for the ground. The building response, if this building wasn't there, if this heavy building shaking back and forth and putting stress wasn't here, we may not have seen evidence of liquefaction at this site. In fact, in 1976, they had a Maduro Valley earthquake which strongly shook Adipazari, Turkey. Not many observations of liquefaction. Well, what happened? It was, it was a bunch of open fields. And then they came and they had a construction boom and they built a number of four to six story heavy buildings. Then, 1999, there's lots of liquefaction. We took very detailed measurements we, you know, with this remarkable case history of all these individual buildings that are seismically isolated, moving relative to each other. We have buildings that actually have translated out, you know, five to, to ten centimeters. We have differential settlement of one building settled relative to the other. This is an incredible case history. We have buildings rotating and, and actually tilting one and a half degrees and punching into the adjacent building. Wonderful except we don't know the ground motions. The nearest ground motion station is tens of kilometers away, and so we're looking for that time where we have this kind of opportunity to gain this data, but we know the ground motions. Unfortunately, you provided that opportunity. Um, you were smart enough to do, put the ground motion stations in the ground so that you could capture this, but as you know, you had your severe series of liquefaction events. And I'll talk briefly about some of this work. Again, this is the work that's a cooperative work between the University of Canterbury and the University of California, Berkeley. I mean, one of the things that really hit me, it's forever changed. I've been doing uh, field reconnaissance since the 89 Loma Prieta earthquake, and then looking back at reports that as back as 1906, the Lawson et al. 1908 report of the 1906 San Francisco earthquake. The thing I learned from your earthquake, and I'm not gonna make this mistake again, is our gear team did not document the ejecta, how much ejecta came out. I mean, when I saw these pictures from the states, I thought I was looking at Buffalo after a snowstorm. I mean, the amount of ejecta, and that really brings forth, you know, the, the integrity of the crust, the, 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 how thin that crust is, is, is a big difference in terms of the, the performance of the, of the structures. Nothing is worse than a foundation than when the actual ground underneath it leaves it and becomes ejecta and basically is now on the surface of the, of the earth. Again, the University of Canterbury group, uh, Professor Chubanowski and his group have done a great job of documenting, and this is for example the 22 February earthquake, uh, the, the areas of severe, moderate to severe liquefaction, and then you know that you've had some liquefaction in the CBD as well as outside for the September earthquake, and you have the June earthquake, and of course you have the December earthquakes. This is an incredible data set to look at where liquefaction occurs, and very importantly, where liquefaction did not occur for these different events. 
And that's why I guess you're so busy right now. I'm focusing, we've seen all of this, and I've worked outside of the CBD as well, but my research is primarily focusing on working with the Mishko on the effects of liquefaction on the downtown area, looking at some more uh, substantial building, taller buildings. The nice thing is you have strong motion stations that capture these shakes, and so you have a good idea what the seismic demand, something that we don't have in Chile. And this is just showing you five of those events. You can see the dates. I'm using the USGS magnitudes, which are just 0.1 less than the GNS survey, GNS science magnitudes. You can see the PGAs that were recorded. Um, if we're just looking at shallow liquefaction, it's as a rough approximation, we can say, okay, the, the cyclic stress ratio is equal to 0.65 times the PGA, assuming that the total stress and vertical stress are about the same, and the R sub D is close to one. And then we have to, of course, put the magnitude scaling factor in there. So with these observations of the PGA, I can take the median of them and I can come up with a meet, and with these magnitude scaling factors, which I just used the Idris uh, relationship that's in the Yaud et al. Uh, 2001 uh, state of the practice report, you can get a meeting estimate of the CSR for a magnitude 7.5, and you can see that when you had severe liquefaction in the CBD, you had you broken some threshold. You gotten up to 0.17, and that led to severe. When you had a, a lower CSR, there was no significant op, li, observation of liquefaction in the CBD. And in these middle ranges, there was some isolated liquefaction. So again, an incredible opportunity to really refine our analysis in terms of seismic demand. And then the obvious things, and some of these you probably have seen because a series of lectures have been given, but just to remind you, you know, something I hadn't seen, and in fact, talking with some of the senior people who have done uh, quite a bit of earthquake reconnaissance, is entire buildings sliding. We saw that really for the first time in Adipazari, where entire buildings slid a meter and a half on liquefied material. You had cases where buildings slid 15 centimeters. There was differential settlement because there was severe liquefaction in the front of this building, and it tilted a degree and a half, 1.8 degrees. You had the familiar case of pile-supported structures. In this case, this pile-supported structure did undergo some differential settlement, but largely did not move down as much as the free field. So the free field is moving down, you know, 30 centimeters in this case. And you can see these signs of ejecta in the, in the settlement. Then you have your town hall, which uh, is one that uh, I know that you're still wrestling with, but from looking at that, I mean, this is a place where you have this auditorium which has these heavy loads on the columns that, that are much heavier loads than the exter exterior columns. This entire area liquefies. There's lateral spreading issues as well toward the Avon River. But that differential movement, I, I measured on the bottom of this beam at this column, reference to the other column, an angle of distortion of 1 over 70. And so it's not surprising to see structural damage in those load-bearing members, which you'd anticipate at that level of angle of distortion. Something that I haven't seen a lot of, I'm sure I'll try to get to the bottom of, is this building, which is not too far from Town Hall, where there was clear evidence of liquefaction. But running a survey in here, we saw very little differential movements. I think the most differential movement we saw between adjacent column was on the order of maybe four centimeters. But much of it was negligible or less than a couple. Yet we didn't see the building punch into the ground. It appeared that these foundations were deep enough on some, probably a gravel, one of your dense gravel layers, that's a, a mat that is essentially the, the bearing layer. If we look at the CBD, uh, again this mapping uh, done by the University of Canterbury shows the liquefaction through here. And there's details. I mean, we, we see a clear geologic feature here that we're investigating. I want to spend some time looking at this because, I mean, we, we often generalize soil properties. We, we essentially say we've done a number of borings or CPTs, and here's a sense of what it's like. And, and the thing that you when, you, when you see the Avon River and you start thinking about the history and you're thinking about the geology and the depositional history, you shouldn't be sh surprised to see things vary over, dramatically over short distances. In fact, you should be looking for that and be very wary about drawing lines, horizontal lines between layers in this environment. As the black map suggests, I mean, it's a, it's a very, it was an active fluvial environment. I mean, this is one indication of what was there 
when he mapped this in 1850, but what did it look like in 1700? And what did it look like in 1600? And what did it look like in 1500? And maybe, uh, you know, in the year 1000. And clearly as soils get older, they get a little bit more resistant to liquefaction, but you have a lot of young material laid out in a very active fluvial environment. And so you'd expect a lot of variability. In fact, one place where we saw that we saw no evidence of liquefaction, we saw a lot of liquefaction, and then no significant evidence of liquefaction it was right up here near Madras and Arma. And so we went ahead and do, did closely spaced CPTs in here. And I have to acknowledge that the Macmillan Drilling Services actually gave us a, academic, a very nice academic discount to allow us to, uh, to do the, a lot of this work. And so this is putting closely spaced CPTs through this parking lot, you can see the liquefaction feature is through here. Can, can the CPT pick it up? And this, this is one reason why we did this is whenever we have CPTs at normal spacing, we always want to remind ourselves on how ra rapidly things can change. If I just go and look at cross section BB and look at how things vary across that, I have to remi remind myself that if I ever have a CPT here and a CPT here, I've got to think about this. This is maybe happening between those CPTs. So this is the CPTs along line BB. We have a couple of CPTs in areas and, and one over here that didn't have any severe liquefaction, no evidence of liquefaction. Buildings appear to basically not punch into the soil and they were uh, level ground. And then we had clear evidence of liquefaction with ejecta and it actually buildings in this area were severely damaged. This is the water table as best as we know it based on the Tonkin and Taylor uh, work that's been done. At, that, at the time of the earthquake, and we have essentially dense gravelly sand materials. In fact, we had a hard time penetrating it. One of our uh, cones that was a little bit offline that did finally penetrate it did get down to a bit softer materials, but clearly in the upper five meters to 10 meters, there was nothing severe in this area or susceptible liquefaction. On the other hand, as we get to this zone, you can see that this layer gets progressively uh, thicker and although there is liquefiable soils at depth, and in fact there are some liquefiable soils at depth over here, it's this shallow liquefaction that appears to be the primary culprit in terms of affecting building performance. This is that liquefaction feature actually comes in and cuts this. In fact, if I'm looking here, I can look back and see the parking lot over in this region over here. And there was no evidence that this building settled relative to the free field. More, more than likely, this building and the free field, because there was some, some evidence of liquefaction, probably settled slightly, maybe on the order of at the most 5 to 10 centimeters. But this building did not settle relative to the free field. Then we had a pipe break that connected this building to that building, so we had very reliable measurement of 4 centimeters. And then with a, with a survey, we came along and measured and saw the differential. And what you see is as you get toward the corner of this building, you start to clip more and more of the liquefiable soil. Also, for some reason that I don't quite understand, the foundation actually changed, and the, and the shallow foundations actually became smaller as you went further toward this liquefiable uh, layer. And the settlement is shown here in centimeters, and the angle of distortion over the last couple of bays is 1 over 50. So it wasn't surprising that we would see the kinds of structural damage we saw in terms of cracks and beams and uh, and where they were connected to columns. Another very important thing is there was clear evidence of significant ejecta here, and so it's likely that we not only lost material uh, around the site, but we lost material maybe that was underneath the foundation in this area, and that partly led to uh, some of the settlement. If we look at a survey, so going back, We're going to, we did three cones along this building length. And, these, and this, so this is the building right here. This is the building that did not have the significant evidence of, of liquefaction. You can, you can see by the schematic that the foundation changed and so that's part of the issue there. But this is the tip resistance in megapascals shown on the right. And then this is I sub C, the soil behavior type index shown on the left. And if you're familiar with that, I mean, a couple of things I want to make a point of is I'm showing you the magical 2.6 line here to just give you an indication of what that is. But Robertson makes it very clear. In fact, I really like the fact that he used a lot of words and called it a soil behavior type index. Number one, he admits it's an index. 
It does not tell you what the soil is. It's an index. It's an index not of actually the soil, but it's soil behavior type. It gives you a sense of this is an index for how this soil might respond. I have laboratory tests on soils that liquefy that have an I sub C number of 2.72. I have soils that have I sub C numbers of 2.5 that do not liquefy. Anyone that thinks 2.61 liquefies, I mean doesn't liquefy, and 2.59 can liquefy, and thinks that that index is that good, no. Now if you calibrate it, if you actually take careful samples and you do things like actually look at the mineralogy, you do Atterberg limits and you actually calibrate it, then you could say, okay, for this project site, I have good reliable lab data that says the break point is 2.55 or the break point is 2.65 or 2.7. In that sense, you can use it, okay? Now, for your soils in this area, they are largely sandy materials and so we're looking at, at, at relatively clean sands or silty sands. And in fact, the soils at these depths are not as important. So it's not as important for this site, but I've seen other sites where just saying any soil with a 2.6 value, uh, a I sub C of 2.6 or greater won't liquefy, will get you potentially in trouble. What you see here is there are liquefiable soils, if you just look at tip resistances at depth. But the thing that jumps out at you is where I had my maximum settlement, my most uh, displacement downward, I had these shallow liquefiable soils present below the water table, which I don't have in these locations. If I use three prevalent methods, the Robertson and Ride method for triggering liquefaction, Moss et al., and the Idris and Boulanger method, and I'm comparing all three in this one, and I'm just using the Idris and Boulanger and the other two because they, they match up pretty well, you get, this clearly should liquefy. It has a factor of safety of about a half or so for the 22 February earthquake. There are some soil layers down at depth that liquefy, but there are soil layers over here at depth that liquefy. The big difference between this side of the building and that side is the shallow liquefaction. We often, or people often go to great depths to say how important deep liquefaction is. The liquefaction beneath your building, right beneath your building, is always the most important in my mind. I'm doing this not because this is the right thing to do. I'm doing this because this is what a lot of engineers do. They take cone data and they use a method like Zhang et al., and, which is based on the Ishihar data, and they calculate the volumetric strain due to one-dimensional post-liquefaction reconsolidation settlement. It does show that because of this upper layer, which is not present in the other one, you estimate 15 centimeters plus or minus, probably it's more like 10 to 20 centimeters, something that's maybe 5 to 15 centimeters, something in the, in the 5 to 10 centimeter range over here. So you do get an index or some insight that things are a little bit more problematic here, but then you actually take what we saw, and as best as we, what we can see from our measurements, this side actually moved down 15 centimeters, but this side didn't move 5 more centimeters, it moved 25 more centimeters. It moved 40 centimeters down. So the Zhang method cannot possibly tell you about something like soil squeezing out in shear underneath your foundation and ejecta coming to the surface and basically mining out the soil underneath your foundation. So reality is complicated, but we've gained some insights. One, as you probably know, is they were dramatic in the CBD in terms of along the Avon River. We have this incredible data set that people are working on in terms of learning the most from it. Um, we really want to look at these things in terms of the ground, the buildings, and the buried utilities. We really, you know, if you have a, in fact, there's pile supported structures in Japan that did not settle, but all the ground around them settled and it broke all the utilities. One very, very bright uh, contractor actually did ground improvement underneath the building and then feathered that ground improvement out as they went away from the building. And so in the free field, it settled maybe 50 centimeters. The building didn't settle at all, but instead of having that dramatic uh, contrast where you can't really even get in the buildings, you have to have asphalt put up against your building to get into it, they actually had that nice gradual transition. So there's very innovative things you can do to deal with this liquefaction issue. What I see so far is that the loose, shallow, typically silty sand layer, when present, led to much of the damage in the CBD especially when you had areas of significant ejecta. Okay. Before your earthquakes, 
we had to manufacture earthquakes. And so a good place to manufacture earthquakes are, is up at the University of California at Davis at their centrifuge. If we have only uh, half a meter of soil in a box, a laminar shear box as shown here, if I shook this at 1G, I would not get realistic soil behavior. So much of soil behavior is its volumetric strain tendencies. Even an undrained shear, pore pressure response is related to how it would respond in volumetric shear during, uh, during a, d seismic loading. And so if soil response is stress dependent, the only way we can get reliable experimental evidence on liquefaction is if we spin it up in a centrifuge. So we're going to take this box that's about a half a meter deep and we're going to spin it up to 55 G's. So now it properly represents the change in stress from the surface of the earth down to a depth of 26 meters. Now we have soil at different depths that have the right stresses and so then therefore have the right volumetric strain response and hence the right pore pressure response. We're going to look at thin layers of liquefiable soil and then again, the centrifuge is not really a case history. It's, it's a simplification, but it's one where I really know what's going on. I, I, I actually, you weren't prudent enough to actually put accelerometers down below the liquefiable layer. And no one thought of putting pore pressure sensors in all of the liquefiable layers before this earthquake hit. So as incredible as your series of experiments, field case histories are, they don't give me everything. This I can actually put 200 sensors. All these wires are coming off. I have pore pressure sensors. I have accelerometers, uh, LVDTs, and linear pots to measure displacement. This is the uh, typical uh, uh, layering. We started off with a liquefiable layer of 30% relative density Nevada sand that was six meters thick. I wanted to start with something that was not too thin to kind of tie back to previous work. All the work that's been done that I've seen today has all been done on a, on a full thickness of liquefiable layer. So we're going to start off with just six meters of liquefiable material and then we're going to jump to three meters of liquefiable material and then the rest of this is going to be dense sand and we're going to have a dense sand on top. The water table is going to be about a meter down and we're going to do a series of six experiments. The first letter, of the first number represents the thickness of the liquefiable layer. The second is the relative density and so you can see that there and I'll, I'll point that as we go through it. But a, a very important point is this represents 26 meters of soil because we're spinning it up to 55 G's. So we're getting the correct stress. We also, previously people had essentially represented buildings as rigid blocks. We know that buildings are not rigid blocks, so as a simple thing, we're going to do at least linear elastic. Now we're actually doing fully nonlinear. We're actually putting little fuses in designed by structural engineers so they actually get elastic plastic behavior. But at this point we just use elastic uh, lump mass kinds of systems, but at least they have you know, different contact pressures so we can look at the difference between a tall building and a shorter building. We can look at uh, a building that is half the width of a bigger building and look at that width of the foundation issue. We have reasonable uh, fundamental periods of the, uh, of the buildings for you know maybe something more like a, a three to four story stiff building. Ground motion is so critical and so you know we want to tie back to all the work that's been done and a, and a lot of the work has been done using the recorded ground motion of slightly modified uh, recording in the Port Island array during the 1995 Kobe earthquake. That's the work for example Elizabeth Hausler and Nick Sitar had, had used and a, a lot of the work at the, the, the Davis Centrifuge uses that record so we want to use that record at small, moderate, and large shaking. But because we realize the ground motion is critical, we decided let's also bring in a different kind of motion. So we brought in one that was recorded during the Chi Chi earthquake, deliberately tried to scale it so it had about the right PGA. You tell the Davis Center if you, if you to do something, you know, if you, if you pray and you've gone to church on Sunday and done all the things right, it will be close to being right. But it never does exactly what you tell it to do. But we've got the PGA about the right level, so the PGAs are about the same, but notice the durations are very different. The, the uh, TC70, TCU-78 is a much longer duration. It has a, di a different areas intensity. In fact, areas intensity is the integration of the acceleration squared over the duration. So it's a good measure of the energy of the system. So you kind of see how the energy is built up during this Taiwan earthquake. 
it eventually has more energy, about twice as much energy, but it's a much more slow, deliberate buildup as opposed to the near fault forward directivity pulse type motion recorded at Port Island. Let's start in the free field. And then I'm showing here is the actual acceleration measured on the base, excess pore pressure that develops in the free field, and then for two experiments, one that has a 50% relative density liquefiable layer, and the other one that has a 30% liquefiable layer, both with a three meter thick uh, liquefiable layer, I'm showing you the settlement in the free field. The first thing that jumped out at me is, and we, 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 we modified the pore fluid so that it was more viscous to get the right hydraulic conductivity, is that a lot of this settlement was happening during strong shaking. That's the opposite of my concepts. I had taught by the professor, late Professor Harry Seed in liquefaction is an undrained response, and then after the earthquake's over, because it's happening so quickly, then you get the post-liquefaction reconsolidation. Scratching our heads, we find some work done by Professor Elgamal, we find some work done by Professor Ricardo Dobri, we find some work by Tokimatsu, and they're all showing the same thing. They're showing that you are getting some settlement occurring during strong shaking, because you got some very high pore pressures, and you have head, and, and things are responding to those high hydraulic heads. What's more interesting is to get away from the free field and start looking at the pore pressure response, the pore water response that's measured underneath the building as well at the, at the edge of the building reference the free field. So again, we're looking at the same two shakes, three meter thick liquefiable soil. Uh, the one that is uh, with the blue line is 30% relative density. The denser soil, 50% relative density is in the red line. In the free field, it takes just a little bit longer, but you get to an RU equal to one, the stuff liquefies. In, under the building actually, especially for the 50% relative density, it doesn't fully liquefy if you use liquefaction as being an RU equal to 100%. In other words, the excess pore pressure never gets up to what was the initial vertical effective stress. But it doesn't have to. In fact, Maybe a better way of talking about liquefaction as a performance-based earthquake engineer is not strength loss, but stiffness loss. Is the, the material has built up pore pressure, it's softened, and it doesn't need to get to RU equal to 100% to soften enough to see the kinds of things that you're seeing in Christchurch and what I'm seeing at Davis when I do these experiments. Another very important thing is that there's a transient nature to this pore pressure, and you have higher pore pressures underneath your structure but in the free field, because they have a capacity to get higher because the extra stress of the building. Darcy's law obeys hydraulic fluid, and if we assume this is a laminar flow and we might get into turbulent flows and things like that, but just for the, for the sake of argument, let's look at taking that measured data and turning it into total head, because obviously water flow responds to total head, and what you see for this, this is just looking at the 30% relative density three meter thick layer, is that underneath the building, if we just look at a critical time, kind of at the end of really strong shaking for the uh, large Port Island shaking, where we have the, the severe shaking is essentially done in 12 seconds, you can see that you have, in this case, you actually got to an RU equal to one, but the total head here is on the order of 10 meters, and yes, there's a drive upward like we normally see, but there is clearly a 3D flow pattern. The water wants to go laterally because the total head here is maybe four and the total head over here is only two or three. And so we have water going out from underneath the building in this case during the strong shaking. And so when water can flow laterally, even if it was globally undrained, if we've got water responding to these total heads that are pretty intense going laterally, then the sand then can basically undergo localized volumetric strain. So one mechanism that allows you to get some volumetric strain during strong shaking is these driving hydraulic heads. Pitcher's worth a thousand words, and so here's the input motion. Here's the excess pore pressures that was measured in the bottom, in the middle of the liquefiable layer. And then we, we measured with the linear pots the displacement of the four corners of the building. You can see in this case, for this relatively uh, robust, wide building, they were relatively uniform on the order of 500 millimeters. But let's look at this picture. What you're going to see is a little, a little bit of waiting time, and then you're going to see the strong shake happen. You're going to see this building ratchet itself into this soil, and if you look carefully, you're going to see the soil then start undergoing post-liquefaction reconsolidation settlement.
Now this is sped up because it's in a centrifuge and because of the timing things you have to go ahead and, uh, and speed that up. Let me go ahead and show it to you again. But this is one of the important mechanisms. This is what I call SSI ratcheting. The building is actually working itself into that liquefiable material. That's why it's, it's a clear soil structure interaction problem. It's the inertia response, it's the loading of the structure, it's basically, in fact, this would be a nice little thing to do on a Friday night on, in the dance clubs that you go to. <laughs> we put in pore pressure sensors and accelerometers, but in the end we said, you know, the most important thing is displacement. As a practicing engineer, all that other stuff is nice theoretical underpinning, but in the end, how much does the building settlement settle? So we had a lot of redundancy and a lot of measurements of displacement. Here again, I'm showing you the backdrop, the actual recorded ground motion for the Port Island record, the large Port Island record. I'm showing you the pore pressures that develop when we have 30% relative density and 50% relative density in a three meter thick liquefiable layer. But most importantly, I'm showing you settlement. This is the vertical measured settlement. This is the free field settlement. So we had little settlement plates in here, and yes, we did get settlement during strong shaking, and we did get some post-liquefaction reconsolidation, especially for the low relative density 30% material. That was on the order of 50 to 100 millimeters. What's most important to this building owner is the fact that we got severe settlement occurring during strong shaking. 75, 80% of the settlement occurred as that building is basically working itself into that liquefiable layer. Then when the strong shaking starts to subside, we start to get the post-liquefaction reconsolidation as the pore pressures dissipate and the stress is re reapplied to the soil skeleton and then we get that kind of consolidation response. The consolidation response is not unimportant, it's just not the most important thing. We see things that kind of make sense. The relative density 50% material does, doesn't settle as much as the 30%, and the fatter building B doesn't settle as much as the skinnier building A. But I turn it around and say, I'm kind of surprised on how little separation there is given the different sizes of the buildings and the different relative densities. So much of this is a loading of the structure through a softened soil. It doesn't have to be completely softened, it just has to be softened enough to allow this phenomenon to occur. The great thing with a centrifuge with pore pressure measurements and accelerometers is to look at mechanisms. And I like to break things into volumetric and devictoric. And one of the things we see is we measure high transient hydraulic heads. We know water's flowing during strong shaking. That water, when it flows, allows the soil to undergo, if it's a sandy soil, it allows it to undergo volumetric uh, settlement, localized settlement. If we get an RU, uh, 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 pore pressure ratio, up near 90 to 100 percent, and we actually get to liquefaction, we get sedimentation. The soil basically is, is resedimented, and that causes significant settlement. We had that happen in most of our cases, but in some cases that didn't happen, so we didn't get that resedimentation type of movement. And of course you do get water, you know, eventually water is leaving faster than it's coming in or being generated, the pore pressures, not water, the pore pressures, and so the water is responding to that and then we do get reconsolidation. More important is the devictoric or the shear induced. If we can imagine a base isolated building, if I could build a, a completely base isolated building so it had no weight, if the soil beneath softens, Statically, I'd anticipate to get more sediment. If I had built that building on a soil where I could pump in water while I was building it so that I had effective stresses that were much lower than the in-situ effective stresses, the soil would be softer. And if I used a method like Schmertman or some other method to calculate static sediment, I would get sediment, additional sediment because of that. So I'm kind of calling that a bearing capacity type failure. That is, the, the, the building itself just has weight and because of the elevated pore pressures and the softening of the soil, the building basically punches in to that material. The more insidious is SSI ratcheting. Because as you kind of saw in that video, is the, the, the building is rocking back and forth. It's the most cruel thing you could do to soil. You pull it into tension, and right when you've got it at its weakest, you come back and hit it with a hammer. 
and you work yourself into it. Light things can ratchet up, heavy things ratchet down. And so, yes, the inertia of the building. It does matter whether you're a six-story heavy hospital building in Chile or whether you're a two-story lightweight structure in terms of the inertial loading and the SSI ratcheting that you put into the, uh, into the problem. And something that I've added because of your earthquake is let's never forget that we get displacement because we've lost ground underneath our foundation because of ejecta. And so we have to think about the crust, we have to think about the integrity of the crust, and, and the development of ejecta. Uh, I don't know of a constitutive model and a Feynman analysis that actually does that right now, but that's one of the areas that we need to get a bit, little bit better at is I probably have to attack that with a discrete element type modeling. Now going back to this plot that I'm asking you not to use, this is the average settlement versus the, the normalized by the thickness of the liquefiable layer. Of course, you think you're normalized by something that's fundamental. This is not fundamental. I deliberately did our first experiments with a six meter thick because everybody else had been using the full thickness of liquefiable layer. I wanted to get results that were consistent with other people so they didn't think that I was doing the experiments incorrectly. But then I quickly switched, Shade and I switched to the three meter thickness. The data doesn't fit the normalization because the normalization is flawed. It's not volumetric strains, it's largely devictoric strains. We started looking at different earthquakes and the rate at which settlement developed. That's the black lines. And I started looking at this and said, I've seen this before. And so he said, let's go ahead and take the input area's intensity. And look at how the shape of the settlement of the building kind of follows the shape of the area's intensity. And so, you know, we use CSR, cyclic stress ratio. We use magnitude for looking at seismic demand. But if you really care about a building settlement, maybe we need to start looking at the energy that goes into the system and how the energy goes into the system. Maybe the rate at which the energy is, is, is entering the system. So from my military days, I wanted to some, eventually come up with something where it showed respect to my older days. So I have SIR, the SIR, shaken intensity rate. This is the area's intensity that builds up from 5 to 75% of the record over the duration in which that builds up. So it's kind of like a rate of loading. And you can see when you have a high rate of loading, you should expect a, a high rate of settlement. When you have a slower rate of loading, you'd expect a slower rate of settlement. There's a lot of dotted lines on this plot, so this is more conceptual. I did have enough data to draw one solid line, so I'll talk about that. The relative density is 60%. The rate of structural settlement during strong shaking as a function of this SIR, the shaking intensity rate. And as the shaking intensity rate increases, then we get more settlement, or a faster rate of settlement. And then, as I don't have uh, as much data, but the trend makes sense, is I have enough data to show that, of course, as the relative density of the soil increases, then the shaken intensity rate goes down. So, of course, the relative density of the soil does matter, and a high relative density soil will actually bring it down, but maybe not to zero. But equally important is the rate at which the system's being loaded. And SIR gives you a sense of that. With all of that, we decided to scrap the fourth test that we had planned and said, let's challenge ourselves and let's look at mechanisms. Let's maybe gain some insights into how we can solve some of these problems and look at mitigation. So let's do three identical buildings. Of course, built the soil built, hopefully, raining down with dry pluviation, uh, homogeneous, and we actually have cone tests to, to capture that. So we have a nice homogeneous soil. We have same buildings. What we're going to do is we're going to have a baseline case where we've done nothing. Then we're going to put a rubber membrane, not connected to the building, because that would obviously change the problem, but, but around the building, or more importantly, around the liquefiable soil beneath the building. That's going to prevent water from going in and out. And then let's put a steel wall, again, around the building, not connected to it. The whole idea is water can't go in and out, and very importantly, the steel wall limits the shearing strain. The, the rubber allows the shearing strain to occur. And so we're looking at different mechanisms. Just to show you that, again, the area's intensity kind of gives you the sense at the how fast or the rate at which the settlement occurs. That's the area's intensity shown here. But more importantly, let's look at the vertical settlement versus time. 
The blue line is the baseline case. And in fact, we, we could put colored sand down, we could then come back afterwards with capillary tension, the sand stays open, you can actually map out, and you see shearing of the soil underneath, and there had to have been some volumetric as well, but you can clearly see it bowing out, and so you're getting that shearing deformation that we've gotten before. When we have the rubber membrane around the liquefiable soil, we get less sediment because the water can't go in and out. The water can't go out, then we can't get that volumetric settlement due to the water leaving. And so what we're getting is, is shear-induced deformation, but not that localized volumetric. When we have the structural wall, then we can't get the water to go in and out, so we're not losing that pore pressure, and we're not getting the shear strain. And in fact, this is higher than it would have been, but the plug that we had to not let that high-pressure water get out failed, and you actually could see that sand coming up there. Okay. Again, we did not want to connect this to that because that would have turned this from a shallow foundation into a deep foundation. The idea here is to look at the mechanisms of the liquefiable soil. But we are getting a sense of the relative importance of the water leaving underneath the building as well as the shear induced deformation. The last part is talking about uh, theory. theory. Uh, numerical calculations. The first thing is, you know, just doing some basic flush analysis and looking at the seismic demand. You know, the factor of safety is the resistance over the demand. The demand is largely a function of the driving stresses, but also obviously normalized by the vertical effective stress. That's why you have a stress ratio. We typically do liquefaction calculations in the free field. Why are you doing liquefaction calculations in the free field? Because no one pays you to go to a, a field and do liquefaction evaluations. You do that because you're going to put a building there. Well, right underneath the building, because you get, yes, you get higher shear stresses from this building, but you also have higher vertical stresses, you actually are being somewhat conservative or about right, and because as you get deeper and deeper, you, the free field calculation is essentially the same underneath the building or in the free field. The problem with this is the edge of a building. And that's why in Adipazari, for example, we didn't see liquefaction in the free field. We see it next to the edge of the building. You see a lot of liquefaction along the edge of the building because this is the worst place to be. You get all the extra shear stress, plus you get the dynamic SSI ratcheting, which is kind of like a triaxial loading on this thing. But you don't get the benefits of the confining pressure. So if you are calculating factors of safety of triggering the liquefaction, in the shallow ground beneath a, a heavy building, you could be off only by a factor of two if you do a free field calculation. We can do better. We can do a true nonlinear effector stress analysis. This is the UBC SAND model that was shared with us by Peter Byrne at, at the University of British Columbia. That's why it's called UBC. And, and like many models, it captures a lot of the key aspects. Uh, it's a relatively widely used model in North America, and so we wanted to use something that a lot of people would use. It doesn't capture all the details, but you can see the, uh, the, the, the sand model, which is in red lines, captures a lot of the key aspects of liquefaction. Let's look at, and one reason I like this model, because it was calibrated for looking at shear-induced problems, like liquefaction-induced deformation of earth embankments and dams. That's how uh, Peter Byrne developed it. And I think shear induced deformation is critical here. Here's our building. Here's the Monterey sand, the loose sand with relative density of say 50% for this one. And then the dense sand below it. This is the calculated shear strains. You can see the material basically shearing out from underneath this heavier building. And you can also see some volumetric strains, contractive in this location, a little bit of dilation in the dense sand up here. And so we can do these analysis and capture a lot of insights from it. If I do these kinds of analysis and I use the right base acceleration, again, these are pretty good analysis because I know the input. I've measured it. So if I use the same input in my centrifuge test that it was measured in my flak analysis, which is one of the big unknowns, is what is the actual ground motion, I can get the actual settlement captured pretty well centrifuge versus simulation, I can capture the pore pressures pretty well most of the time. Being honest with you, I'd love to sit here and talk about this. Here's my, this should be estimated settlement, and then this is the measured settlement. These are pretty good. You know, when I have really bad conditions and everything liquefies, 
I can do a pretty good job with this model and most models of capturing how much sediment. When you get in here, it gets a little bit more difficult. Still, the, the scatter is not so bad. And in fact, I'm pretty excited that I can be within you know, a half to two range. But admittedly, I'm missing some things here. These are ones where my analysis says the pore pressure just got up to an RU of 60-70%. And so I'm suggesting significant softening and larger settlements. In reality, the pore pressures didn't quite get to that. They only got to 40%. And so the actual settlements were much less than what I predicted. And so that just humbles me and makes me realize estimating liquefaction-induced building settlements is probably the most difficult thing you can do as a geotechnical earthquake engineer. Liquefaction is a brittle phenomenon, and you have to be able to know it's going to definitely liquefy and it's going to settle this much. But if the strong shaking is a little bit less or the soil is a little bit denser, it maybe just doesn't get up toward liquefaction and settlements are less. So don't ever believe anyone who basically puts a bunch of lines along uh, one, the one-to-one -one line because it, we're just not that good yet. Findings. Building settlements are not proportional to the thickness of the liquefiable layer. I hope I've drilled that in and you believe me on that one. Free field settlements are volumetric, but building movements are largely deviatoric strains. There is some volumetric strains from that localized straining, and there's clearly the loss of ground with ejecta. Building settlement is related to the relative density of the soil, but very importantly, the rate of earthquake <laughs> shaking. And the SIR, or the area's intensity rate, is a way of looking at an index of that. <coughs> Most importantly, and I hate to spoil your day here on a Friday as you're about to go to the pub, these observations are not captured in the available simplified methods that we have at our disposal. Because they were developed and calibrated for volumetric only free field settlement. That's not the mechanism. What's my recommendations? If you have level ground with no free face, you got a lateral spread, then everything changes. And it, doesn't, it only takes like a one degree, two degree slope to have sloping ground. And of course, some free face that's close enough can lead, lead to lateral spreading. But if you're away from that condition, what we've seen from other earthquakes as well as this earthquake, if you drive a pile, not a drilled shaft, but you drive a pile so that its neutral plane, as defined by Philaneus, is in the firm ground below the liquefiable layer, then you've transferred the load down to that neutral plane. The soil liquefies. It's already loaded that pile top down and it's already settled in response to that, you're going to get some softening. You might have some issues with PY and lateral loading, but you're not going to get appreciable settlement. Now, if you do a drilled shaft that is a top-down loading, it's, it's loading from the top of the shaft in skin friction, and it, takes a, and it hasn't quite transferred the load to the base, and the soil liquefies, and then all of a sudden the load now is transferred to the bearing layer, you will get settlement. So you have to drive the pile so that you establish the neutral plane in the bearing layer. That will, that will pr uh, prevent uh, the building from settlement, but that means the ground around you could settle, so you've got to think about flexible connections. If you have a stout building with a shallow foundation with deep liquefiable material, then you're not really having the, the high devictoric strains put in, so, because the, the load's spreading at that depth, and so everything will liquefy, and then everything kind of moves down together, and it shouldn't be an issue. And you can use the 1D procedures for those cases. But if you've got a shallow foundation that has, is supported on a shallow liquefiable layer, then it's going to largely undergo devictoric strains, and that cannot be estimated with 1D methods. It simply cannot. And so until someone comes up with a calibrated, simplified method that makes your life a little bit easier, it's better to ignore those other plots and just use engineering judgment. Just make some estimate. That's better than relying on something that's on the wrong mechanism. If you really want to do it well, and it's an important project, a good, well-calibrated, well-performed, these are a lot of adjectives I'm using, fully nonlinear effective stress analysis done by somebody you respect and you care a lot about, and that they care about you, and does it properly with a good range of earthquake ground motions and soil characterization, that can provide 
Not necessarily the answer, but a lot of good insight. So I'm a tr true believer that we have that tool available. We have fully nonlinear effective stress analysis, and if it's done properly, you can gain tremendous insight. If it's done improperly, uh, you obviously have a problem. So do it well if you are going to do it. Thank you. Excellent lecture, and I, I'm sure there will be questions or comments. Um, I'm presuming here it's all free water table. What what difference does it make if you've got um, confined water in there? I haven't looked at that. Um, I think that you know, in the end, it's effective stress, and so if you have a very very high upward gradient that is slightly reducing the effective stress, then that's something that's going to play into it. But I think that the most important thing is going to be things I've talked about. Whether you have an upward flow or you don't have an upward flow, it's, it's that high pore pressures that are generated during strong shaking that significantly soften the soil that then leads to the significant settlements that we've seen uh, in the centrifuge test and what I think what we're seeing in Turkey, Chile, and, and, and in Christchurch. So you think you're going to get comparable settlement if you've got that pressure. I think the most important thing is I haven't looked at that. And two is what I have looked at, I see that as being the most important thing. And then I think that that, I haven't seen a case where I think that that all of a sudden jumps into being the most important thing for me. Any other question? Does the building frequency have any... Um well, what is the relationship? You know, I, we did tests where we varied the fundamental period of the building, and then we've also then used our numerical analysis to look at that, and we're not seeing those clues yet. I, clearly, if you have a resonance case and things to really start to take off, it's got to be worse. But it, it, a lot of it is just that the building has its mass and it's going back and forth, and I haven't seen a case where the, the fundamental uh, natural period of the building makes a significant difference in that settlement case. It's more the issue that it is rocking back and forth at whatever frequency and that it is a softening of the soil that's allowing it to work into it and the soil is squeezing out laterally. I mean, the, the, the soft soil probably isolates the building somewhat. Does it change the period? Well, I, I don't like to use the term isolate. Li isolate because, you know, if a soil liquefies and it's somewhat dilative when it crosses the phase transformation line, it's going to lock up and you can get these dilation spikes. And they're not theory because we've seen them. We've seen them in the field, we've seen them in centrifuge tests, and so you could actually get a base isolation with a bumper, and a base isolation with another bumper, and especially a building that is very sensitive to high frequency acceleration spikes, the, the liquefaction might really be a problem. I mean, there are some people out there that have said liquefaction is good for a building. If you have to rely on liquefaction <laughs> to make your building perform well during an earthquake, I suggest you don't do that. <laughs> I was going to say something meaner, but it's, I'm trying to be nice, okay? Um, what do you think of the difference metrics between the Kelvin and post-liquefaction and residual strength? Post of residual strength. Okay. Now, the, the very good point is, I mean, the first thing you should always do when you soil liquefies, and I didn't cover this, but you should basically sit there. Okay, the soil liquefies. Let's get a post liquefaction residual strength, and let's do a bearing capacity calculation to see if I'm going to have a problem with a building tipping over. Out of those methods that are out there, I mean, I, I think the the Idris and Boulanger plot where you do not rely on the soil to, uh, to be draining. Whereas they have the, the basic where there's no, where there is not um, void redistribution and where there is. Use the conservative one because I don't know of a case where that other one's going to happen and I wouldn't want to rely on that. And so I think what's in the Idris and Boulanger approach is appropriate. I think that Steve Kramer has a relationship out. Uh, I have one where I've actually taken a bunch of other people's work and weighted it together. We all kind of get the same stress ratios. I think stress ratio makes more sense than just a constant value, but actually that's not 100% true because I, I think it should be some, I think it should be like a Shansep thing. And there are people working on this right now where it, it's not just a constant, it should be proportional vertical effective stress, but it shouldn't be a, a, an exponent of one. It should be some number less than one. So 
short answer, Idris and Boulanger provide you an ability to estimate it and you can do a sensitivity analysis that says, given that the soil liquefies, am I calculating a factor of safety of bearing capacity that drops down close to one? Because then I know I don't need to use any method to calculate the settlement. I know the problem's a problem, a big problem. Where there's been uh, copious um, ejector loss you know, under the surface, what do you think the implications are for uh, the building? Well, I, I mean, it has to be thought about on a case-by-case -case basis because, I mean, in some sense, I mean, a lot of the sites that I'm looking at have been almost completely cleared which has made your life a lot easier as geotechnical engineers or foundation engineers because you can do things like ground improvement or you can do certain things to just eliminate the hazard or minimize the hazard would be a better way of saying it. Um, you can obviously start looking at some deeper foundations and I know you're worried about the, uh, the, the aquifer and, and some of the issues that you have with that, but driving piles can get you a certain point. One of the worst things I've seen, for example, in San Francisco in the Marina District, which we know it liquefied in the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake. It's going to liquefy in the next earthquake. The problem is that it has a lot of infrastructure already in place, and so it's very tough to do these things without damaging your neighbor statically. So I, I, a lot of the areas I see in the Christchurch right now, you have the opportunity to densify the soil, get to a certain, beha a certain type of response ahead of time, and, and do things that are innovative like, you know, Densifying the soil and feathering it out, looking at hardening the entire area so it's not just your building footprint, but it's your neighbor's building footprint, it's the streets, You're thinking about it as a, as a system. Um, so I, I, I don't know, are people looking at widespread densification over an area? So, Because one, one of the issues you have is if you just improve your area and everyone around you doesn't improve, you're still going to have problems. I guess that is certainly an issue, yeah. not so easy to address. Yeah. It, it, you know, unfortunately, it, it, because of the widespread damage in certain areas, you have the chance to do some things that we haven't had the chance to do in previous earthquakes. You, you can actually rebuild the ground in some areas because all the infrastructure, most of the infrastructure is gone. You start over. Probably just not a comment on anything else. So you said free field deformation don't matter too much to the buildings. The problem we have in Christchurch is that the free field deformation actually occurred two, three hundred millimeters, but it's a flood plain. So okay. you have right now building sitting on that, yeah. you drop two, three hundred millimeters into the drink. No. Okay. So if the entire ground moves below the flood layer, obviously you have an issue. Yeah. Yeah. So I, but I, I'm, I'm focusing on the building's perspective uh, without thinking about global warming and sea rise. Yeah. But no, that's a very good point. That's a very good point. Is you, 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 whenever you get focused on a problem, like this talk is really trying to drive certain points home, I can't possibly do justice to some other things outside of this. So just realize I'm really f trying to, to talk about certain things. Uh, that this, this talk is available as a PDF at the Earthquake Center website and also a paper that I recently uh, presented in Sicily that covers a lot of this topic and references previous work is also available at that website. That's, I mean, one of the great challenges in earthquake engineering is everything matters. I mean, I, I, we have to think holistically. I think that's one of the other things, too, is, is I've been working for the last few years on what we call structure-soil structure interaction. The fact that a structure shaking back and forth puts energy into the ground that affects the neighbor. And we see that for cases when we have dry sand, and we're now looking at that in terms of liquefaction. Uh, you are building a city back together and you have to admit that the buildings next to you do matter. If you have a building rocking back and forth at a half a second and your building just happens to have a half a second period, you are going to share the work. I mean, the, the, the work that the Mishko is doing and the student is just phenomenal. And, and, and I know there's other people have contributed as well. We are trying to put in our two cents worth and bring some of that information in as well. But uh, you have some great challenges in front of you. And that's one reason why I'm taking my sabbatical here. <laughs> so when you see me, it's not necessarily a good thing, you know? <laughs> Since I chase earthquakes. Well. So anyway, join me in thanking him, Jonathan. I thank you.